So we sit to awaken and we awaken by coming into our bodies and our senses and starting to see the laws which govern life so we can come into a wiser relationship with it. What does this mean for our lives? Well, this kind of teaching really teaches a way of wholeness and awareness of bringing our body and mind together and our heart and our action being conscious with our speech, conscious with our eating, conscious with walking, making it a part of what allows us to grow and live. Just be here now. Just be here now. Welcome to the Jack Cornfield Heart Wisdom Hour. We are delighted to share with you Jack's innate common sense wisdom and his clear open heart. If you are interested in supporting Jack's podcast, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Jack. To start meditation practice, as many of you have done with this day of sitting and walking, was actually quite a lot. Some people will start with a 20-minute sitting and do that for a number of months or go to a class and have some instruction and sit for a little bit. There are people who also will come to a 10-day retreat, or we've even had a few kind of unusual people sign up for a three-month retreat who'd never meditated before and say, well, I guess I'll just do it. But as you can discover, even in just one day of sitting, um, although some things are interesting and you learn some from it, it's also not so easy. There aren't a lot of distractions and diversions. All that's left for you really in this place, it's pretty simple, is your own body and mind. And there's not a lot to take one away from that. I'd like to speak a little bit about the heart of the practice meditation um, by posing some questions which may or may not be ones that you have. They're at least ones that I think I have an answer to and then responding to them. What's the essence of meditation practice? Shortly after the Buddha was enlightened, there's a story that he was walking down the road met some people who saw him, and he was in a very happy state. He was supposed to have been quite a handsome prince before his uh, going off to be a monk. Um, So here's this handsome prince, uh, now wearing golden robes and uh, recently enlightened and obviously quite pleased. I was going to say pleased with himself. I don't know about that, (laughs) but at least very happy and very special from all accounts. So they saw him and they said, wow, you you seem very special. What are you? Are you some kind of an angel or a deva? He seemed unhuman. So I'm like, no. Well, are you some kind of a god then? No. Well, are you some kind of a wizard or magician? No, he replied. Well, are you a man? No, he said. Then what are you? And he answered, I am awake. And in those three words, I am awake, gave the whole teachings of what Buddhism contains. To be a Buddha is one who has awakened, awakened to the nature of life and death and the world in which we live, awakened to the body and mind. And so the practice of meditation from the Buddhist or other traditions is not to become a meditator or a spiritual person or a Buddhist or join something, but it's rather to understand this capacity we have as humans to awaken. 
Now, what is that which we can awaken to? What is the Dharma which we can awaken to? Dharma is a Sanskrit and Pali word that refers to uh, that which is universal, to the teachings and to the laws of the universe, teachings which describe it. And the Dharma or the laws, the way things work, are always here to be discovered. They're quite immediate. So there's a story many of you old meditators who've come to these things will have heard before of a pious man, not unlike these figures here along the ceiling, who very much believed in God. And one day, the place where he dwelled, um, uh, it started to rain heavily, and it rained, and a big flood came. And he went from his first floor to the second floor of his house, and the water rose until he was on the roof. Someone rode by and said, get in, my friend, I'll save you. The water's rising. He said, no, I believe in God. I really have faith. I believe. So he sent the rowboat away. It rained more, and the water got all the way up to his neck, and another rowboat came by, picking up people. Get in, my friend. I'll save you. No, thank you. I have trust. I've lived my whole life. I believe in God. No need. The rowboat goes away. It gets up to his nose just barely can breathe, and a helicopter comes over and lowers down a rope. Come up, my friend, save you. No, thank you, I believe, I have faith, I trust. So the helicopter goes away, it rains some more, and he drowns. He goes to uh, heaven after that, and after not very long there, he gets an interview with uh, God, and it's his turn, so he goes in, you know, And he sits down and pays his respects and whatever. And then he says, you know, I just don't understand it. Here I was, your faithful servant. I was so trusting and prayed and so believing. And uh, I just don't understand what happened to me. And he sort of recounts all his circumstances. Where were you when I needed you? And God looks and kind of scratches his head and says, I don't understand it either. I sent you two rowboats and a helicopter. (laughs) And we wait somehow for God to come as some big flash or our spiritual awakening to be some wonderful otherworldly experience. What the Dharma is and what we can awaken to is the truth that's here when we leave our fantasies and our memories and things behind and come into the present. Now, what are these laws? What is it? First, there's the Dharma, which is described as the law of cause and effect or karma which means by one teacher's definition, she said, to keep it simple, karma means you don't get away with nothing. But in a more uh, explicit way, it means that we become what we do, or we create how our future will be. For example, if we practice being angry all the time, in a while, when situations arise, that will be our response to it, and it will create that in other people, and that will be the kind of society we end up in. If we practice being loving, that becomes the way of what will happen to us in the future. And when the Buddha spoke to people who were interested in happiness, which some people are, they said, how can you be happy? And he said, well, one way is to understand the law of karma. If you cultivate generosity, kindness and giving, you will both be happy because you'll learn that it's pleasant to do, and also the way that karma works is your world will become more of a cycling rather than fear and holding, and you'll discover in this generosity happiness. He said if you're kind to people, if you maintain a basic level of non-harming, what's called virtue, if your words are honest and helpful, if your actions are truthful and helpful and based on kindness. He said, your world will start to become kind. Inside, you'll feel kinder and happier. Outside, people will treat you that way. The law of karma is one of the first you observe. If you practice mindfulness and awareness, you become more aware. So this is one thing, one of the laws that you can discover in practice. A second thing that you can discover is that there are two places that we can live. There are many places, but one is to live in our fantasy and our thoughts about things, 
and the other is to be more here in our bodies, in our eyes, in our ears, in our nose, in our senses, in the direct experience of things. For me, says Don Juan, the world is incredible because it is stupendous, mysterious, awesome, unfathomable. My interest has been to convince you that you must learn to make every act count. You must learn to assume responsibility for being here in this marvelous world, in this marvelous time. For in fact, you'll learn that you are only here for too short a time, a very short while, too short for witnessing all the marvels of it. And so one way is to be kind of lost and the other, or in our thoughts and fantasies, is if we have this life, to come into it, to live in our physical bodies, to be aware of the senses, to open, to see what it has to teach us. When we do that and we start to pay attention, we start to see some of the characteristics of the Dharma or the, the life in which we live. One characteristic is impermanence. Thus shall you think of this fleeting world, it says in one Buddhist sutra. A star at dawn, a bubble in a stream, a flash of lightning in a summer cloud, an echo, a rainbow, a phantom, and a dream. That as you look, the more closely you observe, the more you realize that everything you look at is in change. Seeing changes, hearing changes, smelling, tasting, physical sensations are changing. All the experience in the body and mind, all the experience of the senses. It seems solid. That's the illusion of santati. It's like a movie. And when you watch the screen and get caught in the story, it seems like it's very real. But then you turn your attention to the projector or slow it down or focus your awareness very carefully. It's even possible to do. And you start to see that it's one frame after another, one appearing in the next, dissolving in the next, arising. And it's so for our life that it's really a process of change. Because that's so, because things don't last, unless you have something that lasts in your life, please raise your hand if you do. Has anyone gotten any mental states to last very long of any kind? Someone once raised their hand and said, yes, ignorance. It's lasted my whole life. <laughs> but basically, basically it's change. You sit down here and in one day, you don't even have to be a very adept meditator to get the point that it moves all the time, that it changes. And because things don't last, if we're attached to them being a certain way, what happens? This is one of the laws. What happens? We suffer or we get disappointed. Not because you should. You can be attached as much as you like. But even though you're attached, does it stop it from changing? You have a nice mental state and you try and hold on to it. Does it last anyway? So you start to see the laws of things, that things are impermanent, that attachment doesn't work, and that there must be some other way. There is actually what Alan Watts called the wisdom of insecurity, the ability to flow with things, to see them as changing process. You also see not only are they impermanent and ungraspable, that there's suffering if we're attached to them, and that there's pain as well as pleasure in this world. It's part of what we were born into. If you decide to get off on this planet and get one of these things with 10 little things on the end here and 10 little things on the end there and stuff that grows for a while and that you, that you put old dead plants and animals in and mush them up in order to get it to kind of move around. If you choose one of these things, which you have, it's too late already, what is the nature of it? It grows up, it grows old, it dies, it gets sick sometimes. Sometimes it feels good and sometimes it hurts. There's pleasure and pain in it. Anybody have one that doesn't hurt sometimes? Okay. If you want that, you've got to go to another planet because it's not the way things are here. So you sit and you see, I'm just going to be with my body and mind. I'm not doing anything, no big deal. And what do you find? You find sometimes it's pleasant and sometimes it's painful. Sometimes it's quiet. Sometimes it's restless. And you begin to relate to what Zorba called the whole catastrophe, all of it. 
instead of fearing the painful things and running away all the time and grasping after pleasant things, hoping that somehow by holding them they'll last, seeing that they don't. My teacher Ajahn Chah used to wander around the monastery at times and go up to people and just say, are you suffering much today? And depending what you'd answer, if you say yes, he said, oh, must be quite attached and kind of giggle about it and go along. <laughs> there wasn't much more to say, okay? You see that you don't own it because it changes by itself, that you rent this house, you get it for a little while and you can honor it and feed it and walk it and do all those jog it if you want, but it's, it's not yours to possess. And you see, in fact, that none of these things are possessable because the nature of life is non-possession. You're an accountant in the firm. You get to count it for a while, and that's all. So we sit to awaken, and we awaken by coming into our bodies and our senses and starting to see the laws which govern life so we can come into a wiser relationship with it. What does this mean for our lives? Well, this kind of teaching really teaches a way of wholeness and awareness, of bringing our body and mind together and our heart and our action, being conscious with our speech, conscious with our eating, conscious with walking, making it a part of what allows us to grow and live. And to do this means accepting the fact of impermanence and of some pain and suffering and of the fact that we don't control it very much. I mean, you control some of it, but not very much and in a really limited way. If you can't accept those things, then you will probably want to stay in your fantasy because they are what you would encounter when you come here. Now, some people might ask, doesn't meditation fragment us away from the world? You say that it makes us more present. And it can if we become attached to solitude. If we see spiritual practice, we sit and try and get quiet and block everything out. Close your eyes and ears and nose or go into a cave. There's another story told a number of times recently of this woman in New York who goes to her travel agent and says, please get me a ticket to Tibet. I want to go see the guru. And the travel agent said, you know, it's a long trip to Tibet. You'd be much happier going to Miami. But she says, I insist I want to go. So he gets her a ticket and she gets on the plane, this old lady, and brings her things with her and goes to India and gets the visa and the pass and takes the train up to see Kim and gets a border pass and takes the bus up to the Tibetan plateau and gets out. And they're all saying, where are you going? She said, I must go see the guru. And they say, it's such a long way. It's, you're an old lady. It's up in the mouth. She says, I'm going. You know, you only get three words with him, they say. It doesn't matter. I am going. So she goes and she gets on the horses in Tibet, because there are no roads in this part, and takes them and gets to the foot of this large mountain, all these pilgrims, saying, where are you going? She says, I, I want to see the guru. They say, remember, you get just three words. Says, I know, I know. Gets in line, gets up there, past finally the guards at the door who say three words. She goes in. There's the guru sitting there in his robes with a kind of scraggly beard, and she looks up at her, and she looks at him, and she says, Sheldon, come home. <laughs> now, I tell it mostly for a laugh, but the fact is that for us who live in the Bay Area, in San Francisco or the East Bay or wherever it is, the spirituality that's going to work for us is not a spirituality of finding peace by leaving the world. And it's not to say you shouldn't go and take a vacation in Yosemite or have periodic retreats. But fundamentally, for spiritual practice to be alive in our life, it has to be that which, in which we can use it in the supermarket while we drive, when we're walking when we're dealing with our family, to make all of it a part of it and not to escape. Someone might ask in the same vein as doesn't meditation fragment us from the world? I say it can if one tries to escape, but what we're training here is an awareness that can be used throughout our day. Well, what about social responsibility? The, we're on the brink of nuclear war. There's 
exploitation and injustice in every country. There are 40 wars going on right now in Iraq and Iran and El Salvador and Nicaragua and Guatemala and uh, Jordan and Israel and Lebanon and Cambodia still and uh, Laos and I don't know, Namib Namibia and Angola and God knows where else, all these places. Um, and Afghanistan, and it's not just a story, it's painful for millions of people, as is starvation, as is 50,000 nuclear warheads, which could literally destroy most of the human beings and many or most of the major animals that live on the planet in a painful way, easily, quickly. Now one must listen to one's heart in this, it's interesting. You can make a compelling case for different sides. On one side, you can listen to Gandhi, who says, to come face to face with the universal, all-pervading truth, one must be able to love the meanest creatures as oneself. To do this, one cannot stay out of any field of life. Those who say religion has nothing to do with politics do not know what religion really means. And from that point of view, you see that what's necessary is not to sit, but to act. There is starvation. Nuclear war is imminent if we don't do something. There's, there is compelling need, even in this very rich and affluent society of people who are suffering in many ways. And what are we doing sitting around? It's, it's, it's quite convincing. There's another side which is equally convincing. And that is, what is the cause of that starvation and all those wars and that suffering? What do you think is the source of it? There's enough oil. There's enough food. There's enough resources on this planet. The cause of it is greed. And the cause of it is prejudice and hatred. We hate people who different religion, different skin color, different customs. We like our country, our family, our religion, our type. And so there's hoarding and there's grasping and greed and hatred and ignorance. And we've tried through revolution for many centuries. It's helped in some ways, but in others it just keeps going around because we haven't touched the root of the problem. The root of the problem is to discover, for someone to discover what it means to not be caught up by anger, what it means to be free from that fear or that prejudice which arises in human hearts and minds, what it means to be unafraid of that which is painful as, that, as well as that which is pleasant, to be open, to have the heart open to all of what the world presents. So we don't need more oil and food as much as we need somebody who understands how not to get caught in anger and fear and prejudice. And that somebody is you. So instead of it being a luxury to meditate, from another point of view, it's a responsibility for anyone who can to figure out in their own being, in their own life, what it means not to be caught by these forces, to learn some new way, and then bring that to bear on the economic and social and political kinds of suffering as well in the world. It's a letter of mine that's a favorite, and I've read it many retreats. It's from a Nobel Prize winner named George Wald, who's a biologist at Harvard. He wrote it in response to an argument about the starting of a Nobel laureate's sperm bank. Some irate feminists wrote into the paper saying, sperm bank, they should have an egg bank. Why just sperm? He says, you're right. <laughs> Pauline, it takes an egg as well as a sperm to start a Nobel laureate. Every one of them has had a mother as well as a father. And say all you want of fathers, their contribution to conception is really rather small. Nobel laureates aside, he said, there isn't much technically in the way of starting an egg bank. There are some problems, but nothing so hard as involve the other kinds of breeder reactors. But think of a man so vain as to insist on getting a superior egg from an egg bank. Then he has to fertilize it. And when it's fertilized, where does he go with it? To his wife? Here, dear, you can hear him saying, I just got this superior egg from an egg bank and fertilized, just fertilized it myself. 
Will you take care of it? I've got eggs of my own to worry about, she replies. You know what you can do with your superior egg. Go rent a womb, and while you're at it, you better rent a room, too. (laughs) You see, it just won't work, he says, for the truth is that what one really needs is not Nobel laureates, but love. How do you think one gets to be a Nobel laureate? Wanting love, that's how. Wanting it so bad, one works all the time and ends up a Nobel laureate. It's a consolation prize. What matters is love. Forget sperm banks and egg banks. Banks and love are incompatible. If you don't know that, you don't know bankers. So just practice loving. Love a Russian. You'd be surprised how easy it is and how it will brighten up your morning. Love whales, Iranians, Vietnamese, not just here, but everywhere. When you've gotten really good, you can even try loving some of our politicians. Anyway, so this is the other voice. It's the voice that says, in addition to the compelling social problems of our time, he said this amazing thing. Even the Nobel Prize is a consolation prize, because what human beings most want is to be honored, to be loved, to be recognized. And what the world most compellingly needs is someone who understands how not to get caught in these ancient human patterns of prejudice and fear and anger. Doesn't meditation make people withdraw from the world? Anyway, one has seen that for sure. There's a fine teaching in the Buddhist tradition of called the near enemies. The near enemy of love is attachment. It masquerades like love, it feels like it, but it's separate. It says, I love you, but really I'm attached to you and I need you out there to make me whole, rather than just the sense of love as honoring and seeing our connection. The near enemy to compassion is pity. Oh, that poor person, they're suffering. I don't suffer, not me certainly, but they all do in the sort of separates them again. The near enemy to equanimity or balance of mind is indifference. It masquerades as equanimity, feels like, well, everything's fine, basically because I don't give a shit. I don't care about anybody. In not caring, we can find some peace. Real equanimity is when the heart begins to open and we find a capacity to to experience all that the world presents with balance, with love, with openness. So what our training in meditation, and you can see it, it doesn't take very long, you've sat three sittings so far, okay, is that it's not a running away from the world at all, it's really a sitting down right in the middle of it and paying attention to that which is pleasant and that which is painful, that which makes a lot of noise and that which is silent, beginning to listen to our relationship to it to to observe it, to learn from it, and learn a wise way of relating. So then what is the heart of this inner way of practice? The heart of it is mindfulness, listening, attention, attention to our bodies, to all the various energies, to the voices, paying attention when we eat. Which voice do you listen to when you stop a meal? No, is it the belly which maybe speaks first and says, oh, had enough, comfortable, nice and full. And then the tongue chimes in, gee, but that fruit was so good. Let's have a little more. And the eyes say, yeah, and there's more of that other stuff too that we haven't finished yet. And you hear all these different voices. In our culture, we don't listen to our bodies so much. It's like James Joyce somewhere in Ulysses Ulysses, I don't I wish I could remember the exact quote. He says something like, Mr. Duffy lived a short distance from his body. And we do in some fashion, you know. So the first foundation of mindfulness to become wise is to come and live in our physical reality of our body. To live in the feelings, to be aware of both emotions, to be aware of the pleasant and neutral and as- and unpleasant aspect of our experience and learn that we don't have to resist that which is painful and grasp that which, was, which is pleasant all the time. That's perhaps our conditioning, but in fact, it doesn't lead to peace. It doesn't lead to happiness. Because things change anyway. Even if you're attached to them, they change. It's an open-hearted and non-judging awareness which comes into the body and into the feelings 
and then observes the mind as well and its laws, the laws of karma, the laws of impermanence, and begins to see how to relate to it all out of compassion or kindness and wisdom, which means seeing how it's really operating. Sometimes it gets very painful when you sit. Sometimes it's pleasant and you have bliss and light. Then you get attached. Sometimes it gets painful and then you want to avoid it. Thomas Merton said at one point, true prayer and love are learned in the hour when prayer becomes impossible and the heart is turned to stone. And sometimes it's in the very greatest difficulties in our sitting or in our life that our heart opens the most or that we finally get the fact that we can't get attached to things and hold on to them, that they don't go the way we think, but the way that they go. And so wisdom begins to arise. How then to work with the basic difficulties which arise in meditation? What to do when there's physical pain? As best you can sit and note pain, pain, pay attention. See if you can notice how it changes. Sit comfortably, don't make pain for yourself. There's plenty in this life without it. But if you'll notice, it comes anyway sometimes. Then see if you can learn some balance with it. When you observe pain, one of three things will happen. Do you know what will happen if you observe it? Sometimes it will go away. Sometimes it will stay the same. And sometimes it will get worse. That's not your business. Your job in meditation is to start to see things as they are, light and dark and up and down, pleasant things and painful things, to open them, open to them, to start to pay attention to all of what makes up our reality. And that develops what is called in spiritual disciplines a heart of greatness. Oscar Wilde, who was thrown into prison not many years ago, the turn of the century, for being a homosexual, which was illegal then, wrote in a letter one point, he said, the trouble with prison is not that it breaks hearts. It's of heart to stone. If you open the door to the outside, what do you get when you open it? You get whatever's out there. You get the weather for that day. And if you keep the door open, you get the weather changes. If you open your mind and your body and your heart, what do you get? You get everything. You get what's painful and what's pleasant. And there is a way to come to a new relationship of it. So in working with difficulties, desire, anger, restlessness, doubt, fear, these are the traditional list of hindrances which arise in meditation. How can one work with them? How can one make one spiritual practice so that these become workable? There's a story in the community of George Gurdjieff of this obnoxious and very difficult man who finally left the community. He was having such a hard time, and Gurdjieff paid him to come back, and everyone was upset because they all had to pay a lot to live there, and here's Gurdjieff paying this old creepy guy who gets annoyed at everybody and is dirty. And they asked him why he did that. And he said, this man is like yeast for bread. <laughs> now, without him, you wouldn't really learn the meaning of patience or compassion or loving kindness. You wouldn't learn that about yourself. So that when these states of mind arise, restlessness or desire or fear, wanting, if only it were somehow different than it is, or judgment, I don't like this, or worry or agitation, what to do with them? Sit in the very middle of them and study them. Note how they feel in the body. There's desire. Desire runs much of our world. You watch TV, that's all they sell is desire. <laughs> Pay attention and see what it's like. How do you feel it in the body? What is it like in the mind? Give a clear and careful, mindful attention to it without getting caught, not suppressing it or trying to make it go away and not getting involved, just noting desire, desire, wanting, until you come to see its nature and you come to some balance where you're not so caught up in it or afraid of it. The same for anger. Most of us are either afraid of it and stuff it down or we act it out. See if when judgment or anger arises, if you can just sit and note angry, furious, judging, whatever it is, and feel it. 
heat, movement, temperature, energy in the body, certain contraction, different qualities of mind. See if it's possible to experience that energy and learn from it. See how it changes, what it does to you, what its flavor, what the, what the um, quality of it is, its effect on you. And then maybe you can learn not to be quite so caught in it. Doesn't mean it won't still come. Heaven knows. But that your relationship to it can be a wiser one. Do it again and again with fear, with all the kinds of mental states that come up, especially the difficult ones, until you can sit and allow them to come and go like cow or sh cows or sheep in the meadow, as we talked about in the group downstairs. Now, what if they're very strong? What if they're too difficult? They're really, really hard. What should you do? Say, rest. you're so restless, you just can't stand it. What to do? Die. Okay? <laughs> Be the first yogi to ever die of restlessness. Just say, fine, take me. Surrender to it and let it kill you. And what you discover if you do that is that in a way you die. What dies is your resistance to it. And that you just carry on. And you discover this powerful capacity we have, if you work with it, to open to all of our experience and find some balance in it. Now, if you're more advanced, if you've done practice for a while, you may also wish to work with this capacity one has of going into the very middle of something. There's desire or anger or fear or whatever it is, not just to feel it, but see if you can find the very center of it and discover what's there or maybe go through the center in some way. I'll just leave that as a koan for you right now without going further and we talk about it in other retreats. Now, what about all the different kinds of meditation? Here one's learning Vipassana. How about Tibetan meditation or Zen or TM or so forth? There are a lot of good ways to practice. You know, there are these two students of a master who are arguing. One says, it's really good to sit very still and not move and just work with whatever pain comes. And the other one says, no, no, that's macho. You want to relax and be gentle and just be aware, but you don't make a lot of effort in it. And they're arguing, and they can't, they can't seem to get any answer, and they go to the master. And One says, you really got to make effort to bring your mind back and to stay very present and not to move. And that way you get through all this stuff. You learn how to be still in the middle of anything. And the master says, you're right. And the other one says, but wait a second. Don't you want to learn to be loving and gentle, to move if you really need to, and just to find a balance with it all, to be soft and not to struggle against it, simply to open and the master says, you're right. And a third student who's sitting there says, but they can't both be right. And the master said, and you're right too. Okay? <laughs> there are a lot of good ways of meditation, many good ones. There are some that are better than others in the sense that some are, are only have a limited purpose, but there are many major schools of meditation which are wonderful. If they develop awareness or mindfulness of the body or the mind and the heart, our sense experience, and the laws where you observe how the world is working, they can bring you to liberation, they can bring you to freedom, any kind of meditation that does that. So it doesn't really matter which kind you've chosen. If you're doing Vipassana practice, wonderful. If what's accessible or interesting to you is Zen, fine. What's important is that you pick one and you stay with it and you do it. It takes discipline. If you want to learn to play piano, it takes more than just a day once in a while and a few minutes here and there. If you're lucky, after a year, you'll be able to play Happy Birthday to you. If you really want to learn something in a full way, tennis, piano, not to speak of training the mind and opening the heart, it takes perseverance and patience and a systematic training. Pick a practice Use it, work with it every day, work with a teacher if you can, or in circumstances where you sit with other people. And in doing it over and over again, it starts to develop your capacity to open. It starts to train one to be more in the present moment. It starts to um, develop this sense of patience. It brings a kind of compassion when you sit and you really feel what's in there, all these things. <clears throat> now,
Now, what's the particular value of intensive retreats? What's the value of leaving the world to go off on a weekend or a 10-day retreat or even a day here? Why not just do it at home? There are two things to say. First, again, is a story from Mullah Nasruddin. He's out in his garden one day sprinkling breadcrumbs around. And a friend comes by and says, Mullah, why are you sprinkling those breadcrumbs? And he says, oh, I do it to keep the tigers away. And the friend said, but there aren't any tigers within thousands of miles of here. And he says, effective, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> one tends to get rote or go on automatic pilot in whatever one does. Have you noticed that? You learn how to do it, you master it a little bit, and then you check out. And part of the process of meditation is to wake up from being on automatic pilot or zombie land. And it's kind of ironic because you come here and you walk around very slowly and don't look at anybody and you look more like a zombie. <laughs> but inside, it's a different story. It's like what we're doing is breaking our habit. If you walked at your normal pace, la la la, and whistled while you walked down the street, what would happen most likely is that your mind would immediately go off someplace else on automatic pilot. So we use the form of intensive retreats of a day or a weekend to use the silence, to use a bit of stillness, to slow down, all as ways to help break the habit pattern of automatic pilot, to begin to awaken in a new situation. And then you can take that back to your daily life. We use it also because there's a great strength that comes in meditating in groups, especially in the beginning. It's hard to do. And you're sitting here and squirming, you know, and everybody else looks like they've been meditating for hundreds of years, <laughs> except you, and you'd be embarrassed to get up, so you stay with it, which is fine, okay? There's a certain, and that's not a bad thing. There's another reason for taking more than 20 minutes or half an hour or an hour a day for meditation, and that is when you do it in a number of hours in succession, there's a, a greater possibility that you will really get concentrated and that you'll get quiet and silent inside. And in doing so, it becomes possible to see more deeply, to kind of dissolve the, the thought and go to the, to the nature of your experience more directly and immediately, and see, in fact, how rapidly it changes, and that we grasp things outside ourselves, or our self-image, or even our basic sense of ourself is made out of thought and attachment, and that fundamentally, fundamentally we don't exist as some separate entity, that that's all created out of our rapid thought and attachment and to come to from some radical new way of seeing that we are not, in fact, separate. Einstein put it this way. He said, a human being is a part of the whole called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. We experience ourselves, our thoughts and feelings, as something separate from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of our consciousness. This delusion is really a prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of understanding and compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. As we get silent and our awareness gets refined and deeper, the sense of separation and solidity breaks down when we pay careful attention to it. So this is one of the strengths of doing deep or silent or retreat practice in meditation. Now, what to do if you actually attain something in meditation? People ask that sometimes. You should be so lucky is the first answer. But the second one, and the most important one, I remember when I went to my teacher, Ajahn Chah, after many uh, <clears throat> adventures in meditating in other monasteries and different kinds of practice and experiences and recounted them all to him, feeling kind of pleased with what I'd learned and how I'd open. And he just looked at me and he said, well, do you still have any greed? I said, yeah. He said, still got 
fear and anger? I said, yeah. Still got delusion? I said, "Uh uh-huh. He said, fine, continue. That was all he said, just continue. And so what you see is that meditation, as Jamie pointed out in the question period at one point this morning, is not so much to attain some state of mind. They don't stay. You can't get them to stay. But to come to each moment with awareness, with a greater sense of openness of heart, and with a clear seeing. What can one learn of most value in all of this? Well, when, when people die, they tend to ask of themselves only a few questions. Commonly. Maybe just one or two. One might be, did I learn to live well, freely, honestly, authentically? And maybe even more fundamentally than that, did I love well? And all the other things one does, they have a certain measure of importance. But when it really comes down to it, have I loved well? When somebody says, okay, death comes to your left shoulder and taps you and says, this is your last dance, you get a few more thoughts and it's all over. What is your reflection to be? What do you care about? And what did you care about? And what meditation can open for us as a possibility in our sitting and even in the difficulties is this possibility of learning to be freer in the ups and downs and changes of life in its pleasures and pains and learning somehow to open and love, to be unafraid to express that love and to feel it in a full way. One of the most beautiful images for meditation which I've seen was a poster which showed this guru, Swami Muktanand, excuse me, Swami Satchitananda, wearing um, a little orange loincloth, his long flowing beard, a very handsome kind of Indian guru figure who is also a fine teacher. And it showed him, he teaches yoga and meditation, many things, it showed him in the yoga posture standing on one leg like this, it's very graceful, only he was balanced on a surfboard on a big wave. It was very impressive. Okay? And underneath it said, um, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. Meditate with Swami Satchitananda or something like that. <laughs> it captured the spirit of meditation practice and the teachings of how to manifest it or bring it into a world that is full of senses, of sights and sounds and change. So the reason we go through all this trouble and do this strange-looking thing to sort of sum up and finish this talk is somehow to live more fully, to see the people that we live with, to see the trees, to be present when you go for a walk in the park and not be thinking about the bills that you need to pay and what happened yesterday, to live more fully here to be able to love in a greater way by opening in ourselves to all the corners of our mind to that which is difficult and that which is easy. And perhaps because it's our deepest desire to discover our true nature, to to come to some sense of our oneness with life or to understand who we are or what all this strange thing that we got born into is about. Basically, it's the only game in town, if you look at it. Everything else is is kind of um, transitory. And this is to pay attention and discover what the whole process of life and death are about. In order to do it, one needs to cultivate or practice mindfulness or awareness, to have it built on or foster some sense of inner stillness so that we can see and listen to all these things. And it requires courage. It's not such an easy thing. Only as a warrior, says Don Juan, a spiritual warrior, can one withstand the path of knowledge. A spiritual warrior cannot complain or regret anything. Their life is an endless challenge, and challenges cannot possibly be good or bad. The basic difference between an ordinary person and a warrior is that a warrior takes everything as a challenge while an ordinary person takes everything as a blessing or a curse. And so it's a spirit of taking what comes to us and really working with it. 
That's a little bit heavy-handed in a way, even though I like it. And sometimes you, um, you take it as a challenge, and sometimes you do take it as a blessing or a curse, or you worry about it or complain. You can complain mindfully then if that's what you want to do. Okay? You can learn from that as well as anything else.